Next is, is Louis Cage from the uh, long-time author of the excellent quarterly study by the world, for the World Bank on the Chinese economy, and he's going to talk about structural adjustment uh, inside the Chinese economy, which, of course, may in uh, 10, 20 years lead to some sort of a political adjustment, but that's not what he's going to talk about today. Thank you, thank you Richard, and thank you to INET uh, very much for inviting me. I'm very honored to be, uh, to be part of this. <clears throat> I want to make some comments on, indeed, as Richard said, China's structural adjustment. Uh, on its rebalancing, as we sometimes call it. I will talk mainly about economics, but I'll also make some points about the political economy. Um, I think if you want to characterize China's existing or traditional pattern of growth, this slide basically makes two points, and that is that China is here the, the, uh, the red diamond, uh, both in 2005 and then the higher one in 2010. My point of this graph is basically that China's pattern of growth is very much led by industry on the x-axis and investment on the y-axis. Uh, that is true even if you compare it to s several other South, uh, South, uh, East Asian uh, countries. <clears throat> and I, I want to say that overall this pattern has served the economy actually very well. I think the main benefit has been sustained rapid growth without running into the kinds of macro problems that emerging markets often run into. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, but some eight years ago, policymakers in the NDRC, the National Development and Reform Commission, started to talk about some imbalances that they started to observe. They referred to imbalances between man and nature, economic, social, coastal, inland, urban, rural, domestic, external. And in my view, this investment and industry-led pattern of growth has accentuated many of these imbalances that we are all observing in China. And I think uh, one important issue is that this a pattern of growth that relies a lot on capital deepening and on industry um, accentuates the gap that there is between productivity growth and wage growth. That has basically driven down the share of household income in, in the overall economy that has been the main driver of that famous or notorious decline in the share of consumption uh, as a share of GDP. And the mirror image of that, in my view, is the external surplus, which has risen over time. Um, also, when your growth is not very labor intensive, it means that your, the absorption of rural labor into the cities is more limited. And that, in that way, it has accentuated the urban-rural inequality. And also, of course, this kind of industrial growth is very heavy in, in energy and also tough on the environment. Um, I would say that there are a lot of specific policies that you can observe in China's policy setting that have encouraged or accentuated this this, this, this particular pattern of growth. Uh, <clears throat> many areas where we can see encouragement, pricing issues, subsidies uh, to the manufact to, to industrial activity. Um, I want to ask a question, though, at the same time. I sometimes I ask myself, how important are these specific policies, like these subsidies, relative to the importance of a poor country with a lot of surplus labor that gets its act together in pursuing a consistent development strategy in basically pursuing good overall policies. Because even if, if you had a poor country with lots of surplus labor and that country starts to pursue a good industrialization strategy, even with neutral policies, you would expect to see some of these things happening. I do think that the specific policies are very important in accentuating it, but I always sometimes wonder what, where the relative weight lies. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, looking ahead, um, I think um, rebalancing is one of the two main objectives of China's recently started 12th five-year plan. Um, that rebalancing, again, would be towards more consumption and more services. Um, the other objective of that same 12th five-year plan is moving up the value chain in manufacturing. Now, of course, these are two objectives that, ha that, that are very different from each other. And in my view, if we think about where will China's pattern of growth lead China over the coming 10 years, one of the crucial things that it depends on is how much emphasis will be given to these two different policy objectives, the rebalancing and that uh, moving up the value chain in, in manufacturing, which obviously implies very different policies. Um, now, the in my view, the broad agenda 
for rebalancing is something that people who have uh, looked at China before won't be surprised about. <coughs> there is a large menu of, of domestically oriented policies that, that, that we think uh, hel are helpful in, in this rebalancing. They refer, I, I, would, I, can, I, can, I can talk about two broad types of policies. The one would be to help channel resources to the new sectors, the new firms, the new areas of the economy, service sector, smaller, um, uh, uh, rural. So this has a lot to do with financial sector access, the pricing of inputs, uh, taxation, and things like SOE dividends and corporate government. And then the other main broad area of policies, I would say, is to facilitate more permanent urbanization. Because what we have seen so far in China is a partial urbanization with many people kind of moving to the cities, but not really behaving and spending like urban citizens and there are a lot of policy areas that we think are needed to make those people become proper urban citizens. Um, um, and so I think that reforms along those lines would help rebalance that pattern of growth while keeping growth on course. And uh, I, you know, I, I think a, it is possible to imagine a relatively benign scenario for a, a benign scenario that a scenario that is benign both for China and the rest of the world, and I think it could look something like this. I won't go into the details of this, uh, but it is uh, it is published in some of the recent work that we have done. Uh, just to under uh, just to make two points, I have very little doubt that China will continue to be an export powerhouse. We see a very strong and increasing competitiveness of its manufacturing sector that will continue and that will mean that exports will continue to grow very, very rapidly, increasing market share. At the same time though, China's domestic growth is so much faster, so much higher than growth in the rest of the world that simply by, simply by this, if you have one part of the world that grows so much faster than, than other parts of the world, that by itself helps dampening the current account surplus that we would expect otherwise from this relentless competitive uh, manufacturing sector. And how this will play out is very difficult to say. There are many people that have different scenarios on China's current account surplus. In my, in my personal view, I try to do an, an upgrade of that almost every month. It, it, it depends a lot on how much emphasis you want to give to, to these two different pillars. Um, I want to now move to a few political economy aspects of this rebalancing agenda. Um, but before I do that, actually let me skip that. I will skip, the, the, I will skip some data just to, to illustrate on how really, for instance in recent years, in the last three years, we have seen two things. We have seen exports continuing to power ahead, growing much faster than, than, than world imports. There's, in increasing these market shares. We have also, of course, seen imports powering ahead. And, of course, part of this is because of China's Keynesian, um, um, uh, the China's Keynesian stimulus plan at the time that the world economy collapsed. But I would argue that that's not, th that's not the whole story. And it is conceivable that this import growth is continuing. We did see it continue very strongly in 2010 and also in the first three months of this year. Um, now, I want to move to some political economy aspects, um, f starting with the Chinese side. This, so some political economy aspects of, the, of, that, of that discussion on rebalancing in China. I think one, it is fair to say that in China, the exchange rate has traditionally not been seen as a macroeconomic variable. Um, most of the discussions on the exchange rates always, always boil down to um, what is the impact on, on, on exports and, and exporters. And I think this is important in understanding why sometimes things happen the way they happen. Also, there are some areas of reforms that most experts and most policymakers actually agree on would make an awful lot of sense that it is very difficult to get progress on for political economy reasons. These are, for instance, opening up more sectors to private sector participation or uh, moving further with charging dividends on SOEs and having those dividends actually move to the overall public sector envelope. And also, probably most importantly, a an, an reform of the overall system of fiscal relations in China to make sure that, uh, that, that 
public services can be provided in the different parts of the country. Uh, it turns out to be extremely difficult, in my view, because of political economy reasons, to make progress over there. Um, I also observe that in the international discourse over rebalancing in China, I'm, I, I also have some observations. I notice that the exchange rate is always key in those discussions. I think the exchange rate plays a part in China's rebalancing, but it is very unlikely to be to, uh, for it to be possible that that is the dominant driving force of that uh, of, of, of that rebalancing. Um, also, sometimes in that international discourse, a lot of emphasis is put on things like capital account liberalization. In my point of view, it would be very unwise for China to open up the capital account at this point in time. And even there, is, uh, there are calls for financial uh, market opening up to foreign enterprises. I'm sure that that will be useful. I don't think it is a key element of the, uh, of, 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 of the, of the core uh, policy package to, 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 to see rebalancing in China. Um, so then just to close my remarks, I would, I would just ask some questions. What are the consequences of these political economy issues? Uh, I think the consequences are that um, we, again, I, in, in my, ba my base scenario for China is fairly benign, fairly optimistic in terms of the rebalancing that we can expect and what that may mean, but there are really some quite important risks. And one risk, of course, would be that there simply is very little rebalancing, very little rebalancing from that pattern of growth relying on industry and investment. One possibility, for instance, would be that there is so much emphasis in the 12 five-year plan on execute, executing the 12 five-year plan. There's so much emphasis on that pillar of moving up the value chain that, that kind of dominates the, the efforts to rebalance the economy, then I think you could see uh, an unchanged pattern of growth. And all, another possibility would be low quality rebalancing. Um, it is very well possible that we will continue to see a lot of progress, because we actually have seen quite a bit of progress in areas such as boosting government spending in health, education, and social safety. These are easy. There is very little political opposition uh, to these types of, uh, of, of reforms. So that's where we see a lot of progress. And so it is possible that we see that happening. And we, it's possible also that we see some um, giving in to foreign demands on things like capital account opening and financial sector opening up. Um, while at the same time seeing very little progress on growth enhancing and productivity enhancing reforms such as opening up sectors to more competition in the private sector, then you could easily imagine a much less benign scenario. Again, it's not my base scenario, but um, I do hope that the political economy issues uh, on both sides will not stand in the way of successful rebalancing in China. And I'm sorry I didn't discuss the chart that I put in yesterday that I will close in. It's just a footnote, but we had a lot of discussion yesterday uh, about exchange rates and why we don't see a lot of movement on the exchange rate in China. At the same time, all of these discussions mentioned the word real exchange rate. Nobody talked about the nominal exchange rate because these people are economists, so they refer to the real exchange rate. Actually, if you look at the real exchange rate, on almost all definitions, there has actually been quite a bit of movement on the real exchange rate. And I, maybe the most comprehensive one would be, the, say, the real say the GDP deflator based real effective exchange rate that is comparing it to the rest of the world in, uh, strengthened by about almost 5% per year over the last five years. And we are still trying to understand what exactly are the causes of that and whether it is really related to the drying up of the surplus labor. But it is something that we are seeing at the moment. So that's where I want to close. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Louis.